Hi everyone! Welcome back to another episode of Creating a Village. I was really here to help nurture the village within you, and today we have a special guest with us, Dr. Paul Campbell. <laughs> Thanks Dr. for having me. Oh, of course, it's an absolute pleasure. Thank you for coming. Dr. Campbell, can you please introduce yourself to the audience, let them know a little bit about you? Yep. So my name is Dr. Paul Campbell. I am based here in Minneapolis, Minnesota. Uh, we uh, run Minnesota's first Black and Indigenous-led venture capital firm um, that invests in Black, Latinx, and Indigenous technology founders. So we are uh, excited about the opportunity to visit um, um, Atlanta, the Atlanta area with our, through our connections to the Pro Bono Advisory Council and provide some awesome resources for entrepreneurs looking to scale their business. Oh, that's really cool. Well, thank you for all the work that you're doing in that space. Um, my first question for you was definitely going to be, how did you get into venture to capital? Like what made you feel like, oh, this is a mission I definitely need to pursue? Yeah, you know, it's interesting. Um, I I started my first company when I was 17 years old and I never heard anything about venture capital. Uh, mm. It was in, actually, it was in Virginia Beach area in the Hampton Roads. And uh, we uh, started a record company in the production facilities and things of that nature. Um, when fast forward, I, I got involved in the telecom industry. I was still starting companies while I was working a full-time job. Um, never heard of it. And then all of a sudden the iPhone came out and I was there for that launch. And I started seeing a lot of these uh, app stores being developed. Uh, I mean, apps specifically being developed mm -hmm. through like um, uh, mechanisms like Y Combinator, Techstars. I had never heard of it. So I started doing some more research, um, but they say you have to know people in the industry. So usually mm. if you don't know people, you're kind of out on the out. So I didn't really have an in, but I knew there was something I was interested in. Um, and then fast forward a little more, um, I, I just studied about it and read some of the books, but I, read, I realized a lot of the venture capital books that were out there didn't really address how do you raise money while being a personal color? How do you raise money mm. while black? And, um, and so I realized, uh, and that's it's a good opportunity when you start studying the, the the amount of untapped growth potential in our communities. It's not a charity situation. We're the you know arguably the data shows we're arguably the best investment that's out there with seventy mm. trillion dollars over the last twenty years not being realized simply because people don't have uh, a relationship in our community. So we started Brown Venture Group um, after it was in between Philando Castile and George Floyd. People thought we were crazy mm. when we launched venture capital fund here in Minnesota. Um, but knowing that, uh, you know, I always tell people we'll never have a voice until we have an economic voice. And we keep on, mm -hmm. you know, trying to address racism head on. But if we could start a, a, a firm that invests into startups that do technology, we can bypass both gender and racial discounting. Because a lot of times people, um, if they can't see the color of skin, if they don't know if you're a man or woman, all they know is that technology works. So there's a way to bypass those. We started it knowing that we wanted to create generational wealth and there was a ton of opportunities from that space. But when you start looking around, there's not a lot of people who look like me or look like you who do venture capital. So like, mm. how do you do that? So we just, we just said, okay, let's, let's go. There's an opportunity. And then George Floyd happened. And all of a sudden people thought we were crazy. Like you want to start a venture capital firm in Minnesota? Why would you do that? And you want to only focus on black and, and, and Latinx and indigenous communities. Um, so people thought we were crazy. Then after George Floyd, people thought we were geniuses. Um, so that's kind of how we got started. I can go more into that probably a little later, but. Okay. Wow. That's level. really cool. So you were saying like when you were first exposed to it and then you started reading books about it, you couldn't really understand how you were supposed to break into it. So considering where you are now, what would you say is something for another younger person of color who's looking to get into it? What is something you'd say? is like the first thing they need to know about venture capital or before that question what is venture capital like if you had to explain it in layman terms yeah so uh when you you have several different options when you're looking to start or grow a business one is you can go to a bank and get a loan um and that loan means that you own the company that you have no um you're not given any equity to another person but the problem that we have is that we experience artificial created poverty in our communities, mm -hmm. meaning that the cost of capital is more expensive in, um, in the American ghettos and black and brown communities. Excuse me. So 
the loan option is one option. Um, then there's this idea of venture capital. And a lot of people see Shark Tank and think that's what it is, but it's, it's that's part of what some of that can look like. But it's really about if I'm going to invest into you as a company, then in exchange for my investment, I get an ownership stake in your company. Mm. Now, anybody can, write, anybody can write a check as a venture capitalist. Uh, if you're looking for a real partner, you want somebody who can not only just write a check, but actually create value for you and knows how to roll mm. those shoes and help you win a business. So it truly is a co it's a co-creation thing. It's like my interest is your interest. We want to make sure that everybody wins and succeeds from that standpoint of view, but it's a mechanism that it's not for everybody. And actually I talk, I try to talk people out of it a lot of times because people, especially in our communities, we, we hear the numbers and we don't hear any of the risks. You have to hear the risks mm. and understand the risks. There are risks in every financial decision that you, you make. And so you have to consult professionals as you're going through that. But the risk that we have is that as you grow uh, and you're taking on more capital, you can be further diluted, you know, from your business. And, and it's mm. possible that with a board that can actually, you know, remove you from your business. So as you're looking at venture capital as an option, you got to think, how do I want to grow my business? Do I want to exit, you know, within, you know, 10 years or whatever? They, or is it a business that I really want to stake, you know, stay, have majority ownership for a long time? Well, maybe venture capital is not for you. However, if you look at what's created generational wealth um, over the last, you know, 40 years, um, it's been people who've gone through the venture capital uh, side of things, scaled their business, sold their business, and then started to do it themselves where they became venture capitalists themselves. So that's one okay, thing. Your second question is um, about why we can't uh, look at the books that are written on venture capital and 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 think that we can do the same thing. For one, it's we have to understand the historical implications of what created artificially created poverty. So you suppress talent. You you don't let people uh, rise. You know uh, to their highest levels. We didn't have houses right after World War II. You people talk about redlining. And they didn't understand how it actually impacted us today. So if, uh, if, if you have a house, you could take that house and you can get a loan in which to start a company. But since many of our people did not get that house, uh, there's no asset they have in which to actually take uh, to start their business. So when uh, redlining occurred right after World War II, it happened when our knowledge, I mean, when our, when our, um, our economy is going from an industrial economy to a knowledge economy. So many of our black mm -hmm. and brown communities were so far behind because we didn't get the properties that were growing in valuations, which is why still today, most of the solutions that people think about for our communities, oh, if we can just do affordable housing and education, we'll solve all these problems. Well, that's because it's from a lived experience of a community that didn't understand economically what was going on. So the way venture capital works today is you get a napkin, <laughs> you write your idea out there on it, you go to your grandpa and grandma and you say, hey, I had this wonderful idea. You know, would you believe in me? Would you put this money into me? And that's called a friends and family round of investment. The huh? problem is that when people die in our community, we don't get a will, we get a bill. And so I don't know why I have that. So, you know, but, uh, <laughs> um, so, so the, that becomes a problem in terms of, of getting into the space. So like what we did at Brown Venture Group is that we created a new model that starts at friends and family because we don't have friends and family in our communities that have, you know, those that, that capital. And so uh, by first starting off with, you know, in between $50,000 to $150,000, that means that we can get people on the playing field. But the mm -hmm. other issue is that we had to address was, well, what are the barriers to economic and innovative, innovative contribution that we experience in our communities? We know we, don't, we have bright, capable people. It is not a matter of talent whatsoever. It's a matter of oppor um, opportunity. And sometimes people uh, confuse opportunity for capacity. Opportunity mm. is an event. Capacity is what you can do with that event. So people think all oh, these you know, underserved you know, communities are at-risk youth. They don't have, no, it's not talent. We have talent. It's we want to have opportunities. That event that you were giving economically started back right after World War II. And we would just say we want the same thing. And really, it benefits not only our black and brown communities, but everybody. Because just imagine if everybody had access to transformational capital, to transformational resource, how many medicines would have come to market? How many, you know, technologies would have benefited everybody? But instead, we've suppressed because we're afraid of one group rising over another. 
Mm-hmm. So to answer your question, why you can't um, raise money the same way your non-diverse can, you know counterparts can is because we don't have the same tools. We still have our minds. And this is where the patents come into why we work with, um, with a pro bono advisory council and uh, to begin to equip our communities with this, this resource. It turns out that even though we don't have a lot of home ownership rates amongst our black and brown communities, we still have the ability to do intellectual property. And what that means is, is if you if you come up with an uh, uh, intellectual property, I should put a, a disclaimer out there, always talk to a qualified patent attorney. What I'm saying to you next, you gotta go to the patent attorneys. I'm not a patent attorney, gotta go see them. But Pathways brings actual patent attorneys to, to the area. So having said that, um, a patent, is uh, intellectual property mm-hmm. and therefore can be leveraged in the bank as a collateralizable asset. So what we've done at Brown and, and we're going to do VC differently is we know that you uh, there's a generational wealth gap. I don't know what I'm still up. We know that there's um, there's wealth gaps. Um, we know that in order to address those issues, we have to think differently than our, than our non-diverse counterparts. So we created a model that starts with this idea that one, that you can license technology from NASA, or you can license technology from NSA, or you can license technology from a variety of different federal agencies. As a NASA example, and you have to speak to NASA directly again, making that disclaimer, um, they have a, a process where you can license a technology for roughly $2,500. Mm-hmm. And that technology, you, you can then put your ideas on top of that. So then now you go to the bank with that collateralizable asset and you now have a, uh-huh. ability to actually use that to actually uh, get a loan to start your company. But what it does for us, too, one, one of the things that we don't understand in our black and brown communities is redlining just didn't hurt us from an economic standpoint of view. It also separated us, separated us at birth from people who didn't form authentic relationships with us. So the biggest problem that actually exists in finances is actually a relationship gap. Mm-hmm. 80% of deals that come through the venture capital community come from people who they already know. The same is true about hiring practices. 80% of who we hire comes from people who we already know. And therefore, most of the DEI strategies already failed from the start because there was a relationship gap. Question. Did you Go say D E N I? D E N I, like you know, the the diversity, diversity equity, inclusion, uh, um, the the programs that were out there, um, diversity, equity, inclusion programs were failing, and they're under attack. Mm-hmm. But they they were failing because of a friendship gap, and and part of it is that we keep on, um, you know, when you're trained in business and sales, they teach you to pitch like, first start off with the pain points, then you go to the solution, then you talk about the features and benefits. Yeah. The people who have a relationship gap in our communities, they they don't even know that there is investable companies out there. Not because there's not there, just because they lack relationship. So by partnering with our friends at NASA and others, it becomes a quality guarantor that's necessary for people who lack relationship in our communities. They say, Ooh, Oh, you work wait. with NASA. Okay. Go ahead. Okay. Um someone asked a question um from the village about uh, the role of networking in venture capitalism. Mm-hmm. And they wanted to know how how can they maintain relationships when they do come across someone um, like through LinkedIn or others, because it seems now kind of like in my generation, maintaining relationships can get rather difficult because we don't know what to say. Like if we don't have the opportunity right now in front of us, but we met you and then down the line, we don't want to just come out two years later and say, hey, I have this idea, give me money. So how does that work when it comes to that aspect of maintaining a relationship over a period of time when you're not quite ready for someone to invest in you? You know, what you just uh, unpacked is a very uh, good thing too, because if I say no today, it does not mean no forever. Mm. And people catch feelings. I say they get buttery. That's my expression. We have in my house. You get blue buttery. You get a little buttery. But it's it's no for now. It's not no forever. And if you don't keep that relationship going, it, it can be a challenge. So um, you can read a lot of books on on how to network and 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 everything. But really, it's all about the human connection. What's the mm. value creation that you can have for some you know create for somebody? I read a good book a long time ago called Never Eat Alone by Keith Ferrazzi. And in that book, he unpacks 
how you can create your own opportunities. So meetups, right? So say your meetup around a technology concept. Well, you invite the people that you want to meet to those meetups and you create, you make sure you create an environment for them to show up. Why should they show up? Mm -hmm. Maybe because they're going to have access to somebody that you need to, they needed to talk to and you just facilitated that. Now, both people remember you as a person that made that connection. So you're not just networking, you're creating bridges of relationship. Mm -hmm. And that's more important than just networking and handing your cards out and trying to give you elevator pitch, you know, to people who aren't necessarily ready. And also, too, when you're in these, in these events, I, I'll put it this way. People try to sell way too much in those networking events. Mm. The best way I can describe it is, you know, if I ask you, what's the purpose of a resume? What would you say that is? Mm, to showcase my skills and let someone know that I am a good fit for them or I'm not a good fit for them and whatever they they need me to do. Yeah, so the purpose of a resume is to get the interview not to mm. sell them on, on everything that that you can do if you do too much in that one spot because the brain can't hold on to all this information imagine you're thinking individualistically i have a resume i'm gonna go to this person they're gonna see it but it's really in a stack of, of, of resumes so how do you stand out you have to do your research on that person or that entity and make sure that it's a fit for you, that you have skills that could be, people all the time try to go out of their giftedness. They're trying to like go to places they have no business being because they're just trying to get more money versus understanding how they're wired and how they're gifted. So when you do mm -hmm. your research and you sit and submit a resume, your only thing you're trying to do is to get an interview. Likewise, when you're in these networking meetings, all you really want to do is get permission to have another conversation. That's all you want to do. So... Uh, I was in uh, South by Southwest this past uh, weekend, and I've been talking to Ooh. Delta, some of the senior leaders at Delta. And um, I went up to one of the leaders there, and, and he was being bum-rushed by a bunch of different people trying to take pictures with him. And I'd already corresponded through email, and I said, hey, you know, nice to see you. I'm going to follow up with the email later on because mm -hmm. I know that you're busy. I said, I'll be looking forward to it. So now I already knew he'd be bum-rushed. I wasn't – he wasn't going to remember all that because, like, He's just yeah. scattered, his mind scattered that way, but he remembered the email. So when I emailed him, he followed up and introduced me to the next people that I needed to to know. So one of the things that's challenging for the and you know for your generation is uh, there's all kind of ways to connect, but people aren't really connecting. Mm -hmm. so you can connect and you can get likes and you do things like that, but the, there's a lost art of connecting. And really, it boils down to not thinking of yourself only. How can you create a win-win situation always? So that's the best way I've found to not network, but establish relationships. Yeah. And it's funny that you just said that, like not thinking of yourself. I was recently listening to this podcast. I was saying we've kind of come into this selfishness era and not that like self-care and thinking of our mental health isn't important because it is, but when we've kind of put it on this pedestal of any slight inconvenience when like if a friend comes to me and say, I need you to pick me up from the airport. Now people are like, you can get an Uber or you can go on the train or something. Whereas in mm -hmm. earlier generations, we'd be like, yes, I can go pick you up from the airport, even if maybe for the day I was just going to stay in bed. But now we're like, oh, mm -hmm. my plans are canceled. Yay, I don't have to go outside anymore. And so I think we do need to kind of get back to that connection phase that you're talking about, trying to figure out how we can mm -hmm. still value self-care, but also understand that we do have to put ourselves in, I guess, uncomfortable or like not ideal situations, but it, it's still going to be fun anyway. Um, yes. Yeah, so well, I, I, I think that one, one, one of the things that I hear is a lot of young people um, uh, say to me and they're like, they come up and they're all odd that I'm in VC and they're like, oh, Dr. Campbell, this and that. And like, it is for me, it's an awkward thing because I, I, I remind everybody, everything you know now you had to learn at some point. Mm. The only difference between me and you is that I put in some time when no one else was looking and I, I applied myself. I, I, I was self, more self-taught than anything else, even though I have multiple degrees. It's that it's a continuous 1% daily improvement. And so you feel like you have, like you don't belong in these, in these areas, but you have to remember you have something, always have something to bring. No one mm -hmm. has a corner marker on knowledge. And it's kind of like 
okay, yes, I don't know everything, but I know that if somebody points me in the right direction, I'm going to be good soil in which to take this information. And one of the best ways to um, learn is to teach somebody. So you learn something, your moral obligation is to lift as you climb and teach someone else a person. Because a lot of times if you get this knowledge and you try to hold it to yourself, it doesn't multiply this. It's additive. It's not multiple, you know, most of that perspective. So mm-hmm. um, I just say, say to a lot of young people who are watching the podcast, because it's not, I mean, I, I jokingly say sometimes, sometimes you see people on the panel and you're like, wow, I want to be them. But they only have two and a half months more experience than you do. Oh, yeah. <laughs> right. <Wow. laughs> and they and, and and you're thinking just because they're on a platform that they have a, a position of power, and that mm-hmm. sometimes it gets to people's heads. But like I think that you know we're living in a, a unique time in our in our economic history, and every voice, young, you know, middle aged and old, is necessary. And there's no there's nobody has a corner market on knowledge. And at retirement, as I mean, I know it's a little bit about a bunny trail. Retirement is actually a relatively new concept in world history and it causes people to devalue, you know, wisdom and, and there's a difference mm-hmm. between knowledge and wisdom. And so as much as we want to be relevant as young people, cause I'm in the middle age where like they, I'm young to some people and old to others, but um, it, it's just really important to have the intergenerational, you know, community, like you, the village, right? The community village yeah. aspect of it um, because rugged individualism actually is one of the downfalls of our society. It doesn't help us out to get where we want to go. Yeah. Well, you know, that's that's a good conversation topic for another day. But getting back <laughs> to <laughs> getting back to um intellectual property. So how are you just mm-hmm. saying that um teaching people is a good way to gain that wisdom and gain that knowledge? When it um I attended the one of the pro bono advisory council events a couple of weeks ago and i forgot mm-hmm. who i was talking to but they were saying um when you do have an idea don't even tell the um the lawyer about it just be- before you know um that you're willing to go through with the patent process because now they have in place they used to have in place where whoever came up with the conception of the idea first and if they didn't patent it until someone else try to patent an idea then they could still get the patent but now if you i think now it's whoever um, files the patent first so when it comes to mm-hmm. intellectual property and sharing with people because like you were saying writing the idea down on a napkin and then telling your family about it um how does that how would you recommend people go about that process of coming up with ideas and then i guess possibly going to pathways about it yeah, well, uh, I think the reason why pathways exist, we got to talk about that before I answer that question because mm-hmm. it's um, when we when we um, went we went to the undersecretary Kathy Vado and and, Der- and deputy director Derek Brent, and they had interest in making sure they're promoting the pro bono uh, uh, work around the country through the USPTO. The Pro Bono Advisory Council is a nonprofit organization that helps to partner and, and, and facilitate some of these opportunities around the nation. They said, "We hey, look, we're in all 50 states now. And it was started by Jim Patterson, who was there that night, too, mm-hmm. um, in, in partnership with the former um, director, uh, David Capos. But they said, we're in all 50 states. That's great. But what's the next phase? And I come from the venture side of things. They said, you know what? It's, it's nice if you have a piece of paper. But you have to make it into a business. How do you fund? How do you scale um, that that business? And the reason why I was particularly interested in, in joining the board and um, in contributing to Pathways is because when I would see bright, talented people who had great ideas, but they had no patents, it was very difficult for me to invest into them because there was no moat of protection around them. So uh, you have to you have to start as early as possible, and you have to get it get, get it going. And so the pro, pro the pro bono program offers up to ten thousand dollars of IP assistance through the pro bono advisory council and the yeah. network that's around the country. And so and there's a there's a network in, in Georgia that can provide these services. But the reason why venture capitalist cares is because I want to de risk my investment. Mm-hmm. For answering your question. Um, there's a lot of there's a lack of trust in general in our communities because of historical traumas that we've experienced. 
um, uh, people taking in and exploiting our ideas. And so well, no one just knew the mechanism to actually to protect it from that standpoint of view. So I always recommend, you know, as soon as you can uh, file a patent um, to do a provisional patent is not as much as people think it is and it at least gets you going, you know, from that standpoint of view. But again, one of the benefits of, of pathways is that we're bringing uh, content from the USPTO. We're bringing content from thought leaders in the area who, who've done this before. And um, they, then you can be uh, through the app we have as PBAC Connect, PBAC Connect. You can mm -hmm. download that and you can watch this content on how to do trademarks, how to do uh, patents, how to do uh, um, scripts. And that free content gives you enough to start to figure out what, when should I do this? And then you, um, through the app, you can figure out who's connected in, in the area. And, and just for, as, a, as a note, many college students already qualify for this because of income, you know? Yeah. Uh, most of them have a job quite yet, so that's very good. But I think the sooner you can do that, the better. Now, the other part of that is when do you go out and raise money uh, for that, with that idea? Because, you, you, you know, you want everybody to sign NDAs and things like that, but venture capitalists don't sign NDAs. The reason mm -hmm. why we don't sign NDAs is because if we sign an NDA for every person that came along, we wouldn't be able to properly vet, you know, the deals and things like that from that same point of view. So that's why we don't sign NDAs. I can't because it would be it'd be hard for anybody to enforce all those. I see hundreds of thousands of different types of ideas. And so that's yeah. there. But going back to, hopefully I answered your question, mm -hmm. you know, as far as the importance of it. So, yeah. Okay. Okay. Um, kind of going back, you mentioned provisional patents. Mm -hmm. What is a provisional patent? Because it sounds like that might be like a basic level one. Yeah, it took a couple hundred dollars to uh, start filing for that. But it's it's it allows you to go to an actual patent. You have like a, um, like a year mm -hmm. uh, or so to from the time you have a provisional patent. And that gives you the ability oh. to... End to go out and start to um, to at least raise money with a provisional patent because you're still protected as far as the file date. That's what they were talking okay. about when you're talking to a person, the file date. But um, the provisional patent to go into a full plan patent is, is, is to give you time to build that up. Now, the problem that we have in our communities is being resource strapped, right? So mm -hmm. how do we get the provisional patent? Because it can be up to, it can be $10,000, $20,000 you know, to, to go through the whole process. And this is where the program yeah. advisory council comes in. So if you especially young and you're don't have a lot of money and you can income qualify, this is a great resource uh, to begin that process. And at the end of that process, you can come to talk to somebody like myself and you're, it's, it's a, it's an easier conversation to be had. Okay. Um, we're coming close to time. So I'm going to ask this one question from the village. Um, what does it mean to be an innovative entrepreneur, like in today's business landscape? Yeah. So um, <laughs> you hear buzzwords all the time when you're in my seat. And I'll, let me say this some, some of us too. I get the benefit of seeing all these smart people, right, mm -hmm. come to me and pitch their ideas. So I'm I'm getting just as much value out of the pitch as the person who's pitching to me, like me, if they do get investments from us, it's I'm getting a lot of value because I see a lot of smart people. But I hate the word for people say uh, groundbreaking or whatever the word is to talk yeah. about the thing that they're doing. Um, innovation is is relational. It's it's mm -hmm. um, you're always building on somebody else's idea. You know, when you look at um, I'm a retired music producer. And I, I always did this like mashup of different sounds in my, you know, in my head. And, and this, that's how innovation actually works. And you can have an idea and I can have an idea, but we bring it together. We have something new that wasn't there before. And so it actually benefits to actually co-create that way. I mean, when you look at um, the iPhone, for example, right? Many of the technologies that went into that device were thought about from different people. Like NASA, for example, was the one that created the cell phone camera. Like the mm -hmm. typewriter went to the computer, went to the inside the phone, microchips and every all the different things that you look up, it's like a mashup of mashups. And so I think innovation today is still like innovation back when Leonardo da Vinci was around and he was 
studying different topics. He was so curious. The minute you become a specialist and you know it all, you don't, you're not as innovative anymore. Mm. It's you have to stay humble, stay hungry, stay smart, stay curious, study different subjects, and then you're always blending them together. So I see innovation um, as a timeless principle. It, it doesn't matter how high tech or low tech it is. Like you take a, 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 a rock and you open up a, a you know a can of pop or whatever, and that's that's innovation, right? So like you take and then this is a good, good example that you build on. So Play-Doh, as an example, was originally designed to clean wallpaper because when they had the uh, when it burned in the fire, the soot would go onto a wall, and so they wanted a non-toxic um, a, a material that would clean that up. So mm -hmm. a teacher was trying to uh, have a non-toxic material they can use for uh, education purposes, add dye, and here you go, the Play-Doh industry, you know, uh, or as Play-Doh started from that standpoint of view. So you can repurpose ideas. And this is why um, the, the Federal Laboratory, cons of, uh, I'm gonna say it right again, the Federal Laboratory Consortium of Tech Transfer Offices, federallabs.org. If you go on to federallabs.org and you look at the video, you will see 300 of our nation's top uh, metal, uh, research facilities have licenses sitting on the shelves for entrepreneurs like you and I who have, who are very entrepreneurial, but maybe don't have an idea right away, but mm -hmm. you can take the idea and then you can build on top of that. Um, that's a resource that many people don't know about. Uh, so you take the federal labs, you put the USPTO pro bono program, and now you have a really smart, uh, a really awesome connection point in which to actually start a company. And then you can find, and you don't have to be overly technical either. Excuse me, that's another thing that people don't realize is that when you're overly technical, sometimes you can't sell the thing <laughs> because you're overly technical. So you need all kinds of people in order to bring a product to market. You need smart technical people. You need sales people who know how to hustle, how to grind it out, you know, knock on doors. Everybody has value when it comes to bringing a product like that to market. Mm. Yes. Okay. Okay. I like that answer. Before I get to our last question, um, we have a segment on the podcast called hashtag in my village, where we ask the guests to share either a pivotal moment in their life or like a life lesson um, that significantly impacted them. Um, so can you please share something with the audience? <laughs> yeah, I've had quite a few of those. Um, you know, I'd say um, being here in Minnesota, um, we were at ground zero for the racial reckoning that happened. Obviously with George Floyd, but as I mentioned earlier, before George Floyd, there was Philando Castillo. Philando Castillo really personally rocked me. And it was, uh, I, I grew up across the street from the high school that he went to. Uh, he was known in the community. Um, and uh, in fact, one of our portfolio companies was, was um, good friends with him as well. The people who uh, created Turn Signal, um, they had some connection points there. Turn Signal is an app where if you get pulled over, um, you can uh, immediately have a, a law enforcement professional come on, um, you know, from that perspective. So it reduces the, uh, the, the police interaction from that standpoint of view. But that, that for me, combined with my own professional experience, because what they tell you is education is a great equalizer. Just get an education and you'll, you'll, it will equalize a lot of things. And they tell you that, um, you know, be number one at sales, be whatever, the, be top at your, you know, from that perspective and you'll you'll be in but what i found was it was a combination of philando castillo's murder uh with my own experience in corporate america where i did all the things to tell you to do and they say oh you're overqualified mm -hmm. but then i said i do i do not want to be in a place of bitterness because bitterness only affects you it doesn't affect the other person i i want to stand on the shoulders that have gone before us then to Dr. King, to Malcolm X, and Marcus Garvey, those, those leaders, I couldn't think that I could be better than them or anything like that, but I want to build on what they've actually taught us. And so I think what I learned from that pivotal moment was through technology, again, we will never, uh, they will never see us as humans um, the same way because of like, using words. For example, if I tell people I work for at risk youth, mm -hmm. the first face they see is us. But the question is why? But I also know that it's a relationship thing, right? 
So that that becomes deterministic in how they see us. So in order for us to actually build on what all these great thinkers had did, and I'm not saying I agree with everything they thought about, but there was things you're building on. I knew that we had to bypass um, racism altogether. And that was a pivotal moment for me. And I studied behavior economics along the way, which actually helped me realize that because without relationship, there's otherization. And that's a risk. Risk is avoided in an investment. So for me, the, the pivotal moment was I believe that we're living in a unique time, but we have a moral obligation, I believe, to take what we've learned, take what I've learned, and share it with the community to lift us, lift us decline. Because if we don't, back after civil rights, it was um, um, us two and we're through, us four and no more. And then the hip hop generation, when it started, was I'm going to get mine, you get yours. That, none of those strategies have worked historically. In order for us to truly create generational wealth together, we have to put our egos aside. And we have to lift as we climb the lights went off um, <laughs> and help each other out from that perspective. So that's, that was my pivotal moment. Okay. Wow. That's amazing. I really like that. We're, we're going to turn into a new historical era and it's going to work. It's going to work. Yes. Um, okay. So Indeed. now the question I have for you is for Pathways Atlanta, why should young mm -hmm. people, young generation, but people in general also come out to this event so that they can learn more about how they can secure um, generational wealth for themselves and their families? Yeah, because most people don't understand why patents actually make a big difference. But um, when you understand how to how do capital stacks, intellectual property is a capital stack, right? Um, this has the ability to act as a force multiplier. That's a military term they use to, you put a small amount of force and it lifts a big amount of things. Um, it's it's knowing how, because we're gonna have folks like uh, from NSA, the National Security Agency, talk about how to license technologies to start companies. We're gonna have folks from NASA come up and tell you, you know, how What's a small business innovation research grant? You're going to learn from the USPTO directly and not from a late night television show what IP is all about and, and those, those, those stacks. It's, it's life changing. It's transformational. Um, one of our entrepreneurs we had in our, our portfolio license the technology. From, you, you saw him, I think, Chris, uh, when it was at that, uh, the event, mm -hmm. license the technology from NASA, went around and put his IP through the pro bono, um, work and then was able to then Put himself in a position to attract further dollars from investment um, that has put him in a good spot to eventually you know i believe to become a billion dollar company and he's not a professional athlete so all we know in our communities a lot of times is you can become a rapper producer i was just one of those right <laughs> <laughs> you can be a professional athlete you know or you can sling drugs right and so this is yeah. this is a way to create generational wealth that's sustainable it's and it, it requires a village to do it too because it's it's not you know just that so and we really want to make sure that when we came to town we're we're actually guests you know in the in Atlanta and Atlanta knows what Atlanta is best and we're saying this could be a resource that Atlanta could use to to further attract other opportunities to launch more companies that create more jobs in in, in the underserved communities and not underserved under talented underserved but. If you get those people served and provide them transformational resources, imagine how much of that $70 trillion could have came to Atlanta by making sure mm -hmm. everybody had access to transformational resources. So this is something that uh, you're never going to see that a, a, a free event like this with the level of quality that you're seeing there. Venture capitalists are coming straight to the talk about that. Banks are coming to talk about you know what it is they're going to do. Um, and how they can help them out. But you'll learn how to patent, you'll learn how to scale, and you'll learn how to fund your innovative idea and, uh, in such a way. And, the, and then the, the app you can download too will be a, a continuous resource from that perspective. So I think you don't want to miss uh, Pathways uh, Atlanta because it's going to come, you know, it's going to be from generations to come. Yes, that sounds absolutely amazing. And like you were saying, I do think it is kind of, in my generation and or more so the younger generation of their parents because I was recently having a conversation with my dad and we were talking about my nephew and what he's going to do over the summer and my dad said out of his own mouth yeah he's really smart and he loves playing video games and then he says we should put him in a basketball camp 
And my my thought process was, oh, he loves video games. We should send him to a computer science camp or a gaming camp where he can learn how to code. Mm-hmm. And then when I expressed that to my dad, he's like, oh, I didn't even know those were things. And so there is that generational gap of we know how what keeps us out of trouble, sports. And so a lot of the mm-hmm. times it's the parents sending us that route because they that's what they know. But now when we expose ourselves at the mm-hmm. younger generation and then we go back to our parents and teach them and tell them about what we're learning, we can definitely trailblaze a whole new path for our communities. So I think this is going to be a Absolutely. great opportunity. Yes. Absolutely. Okay. Now, can you leave, well, leave us with your closing remarks. Um, it can be any advice related to this topic or not related to this topic, whatever you want to leave the audience with. Well, it's kind of the reason why pathways is so is so important. Um, there are multiple trillions of dollars uh, have come down uh, through the federal government, the Chips Act, the Inflation Reduction Act, the uh, infra- uh, Infrastructure um, and Jobs um, Act, uh, the American Rescue Act. Lots of these uh, resources are are available, but we as people of color will not be able to participate in these once in a generation opportunities because of two words, capacity and readiness. Mm-hmm. So what Pathways does for the community, it prepares us to address the capacity and readiness of questions that are in these documents. You can read them and you don't, if you don't take my word for it, download the, the acts, read them and you'll read this. It's like written so people who are underserved can never participate. So this resource mm-hmm. will allow us to pull down trillions of dollars of opportunity in our community. For example, I was talking to one entrepreneur who got $10 million of congressional appropriations to start his company. He had no customer and no technology, but he got $10 million to, to build capacity and readiness to take down further opportunities. So we're going to be talking about these opportunities and how to do that um, because from my side of as a venture capitalist, every person who knows how to do that, that I invest in, you know, does not dilute me as I'm investing to them. But we're not going to, as a, as a community, we're not going to be able to participate if we do us two and we're through us for no more, or I'm going to get mine, you get yours. We absolutely have to lift the decline. Otherwise, uh, this money will, will evaporate and we'll be sitting for 20, 50 years down the road still with the same problem. So, Come to Pathways, learn about how to create this generational wealth, learn how to, you know, lift each other up as a climb and to make, you know, a new path of, of prosperity and human relationships. So. Yes. Oh, thank you so much for coming on. This is so amazing. Um, and I'll make sure that if audience, if anyone has any further questions, make sure to um, either leave them on our website or leave them in the comments below um, or DM us also. DM us on Instagram so we can try to get your other questions answered. Um, Dr. Campbell, thank you so much for coming on. Can you please tell the audience how they can connect with you if you would like them to? You don't have to share your information. If you don't want to. No, no, that's fine. I, I'm on I'm LinkedIn. Um, you can try, find me on LinkedIn. I would do other other things, but I'm dyslexic, so 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 Twitter doesn't work for me or X, and uh, and so I have to like do all this extra spell checking, um, and uh, I'm not very. I mean, I don't have time to do the TikTok videos, but uh, <laughs> I, I I used to do back in the day. But no, that's you can find me on LinkedIn, and uh, yeah, um, <laughs> I jokingly say I did TikTok before the thing because we did. I'm a, you know we did a lot of creative stuff back in the beginning. Um, yeah, you can find me on LinkedIn. And uh, you can find me in Atlanta, you know, during uh, Pathways, and I would love to talk to you. Um, sometimes people reach out to me now and get to people right away. But, like, if you're here present, you're in Atlanta, you're sitting there, we'll, you know, definitely have a conversation. So, Yes, and Pathways Atlanta will be held at Emory University April 12th. Um, I will also leave the link to register in the description and the show notes. So if you're listening on audio platform, you can go to the show notes. If you're listening on YouTube, you can go to the description and you will find the event registration link. Yes. Okay, cool. All right. Thank you so much for coming on. Audience, I know you learned a lot today, so make sure to write it down, 
maybe follow through right now or store it away for later. Whatever you do, don't forget about it. And make sure to share this with someone who also needs to come to the event or needs to or wants to learn about this or someone you know who is innovative and needs to get their ideas patented. All right. Thank you all so much for listening. And remember to keep creating a village wherever you go. Thank <laughs> you.